All right. Hello, Javier, and hello to people who are watching us. Uh, the viewers of my channel most likely are familiar with Javier Rivera. We have, we have done some collaborations before. Uh, we have a discussion on anger. And Javier, I just want to bring to my viewers' attention, he is currently running a book club, a series of discussions uh, centered on Ibn Arabi, a, a Muslim Sufi thinker. That has been really engaging, really interesting. I've been participating in as many of them as I, as I can so far. Th there is one tomorrow, and they are all live stream. And Javier continues to be uh, productive, uh, thankfully, very fortunately. Uh, and he's been you know, exploring things. The, the method, there's a method, but the method is haphazard. It's exploratory, and you talk about things that are alive at that moment. Last week, was it last week? We did a live stream together, which is like, this is now the introduction for our discussion today. Uh, last week, we did a discussion about a Japanese movie, a recent movie, 2021, based on a Murakami short story. And the title of the movie and the story is Drive My Car. And I really enjoyed that. One of the references, something that is mentioned in the movie is a play by Anton Chekhov called Uncle Vanya. So I thought maybe we could go watch that, a version of that. I think we, we watched different versions of it, but I think they're pretty close. And now we are here to talk about Uncle Vanya. We talk about Uncle Vanya and maybe we will think or talk a little bit about what it, how it could influence our understanding of Drive My Car and Murakami's project. So any initial thoughts did you like it um, oh yeah I, <laughs> so that, that's the first thing that I, I just want to say i absolutely loved it um it was such a powerful even even the, the one the version that you sent me uh it, it was so powerful and it was so good that i was surprised how relevant it was and, and hopefully that's something that you know we can get into uh that i feel you could say when we look at drive my car, it doesn't explicitly tell you how relevant it is in comparison to Uncle Vanya. Uh, when we look at, it's almost like the, it, it kind of reverses itself where it becomes hidden. And I wonder if that's sort of a symbolic, uh, uh, symbolic of like destitution itself where it becomes so destitute now mm. that you can't even determine anymore how, how far you have gone away uh, to where now it's just, you know, you know what I'm saying? Cause I, yeah. I and I was starting to think that maybe this was the director's creative uh, put in there. Mm -hmm. Do you mean that there is a kind of self-awareness in the character in uncle Vanya that is lacking? in the more recent stories like Drive My Car. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. But maybe we can begin with this first note that you know, we are dealing with a character type, with a type of person, with a type of destiny that is portrayed in one way in Drive My Car and it is portrayed in a, maybe its original uh, place, the place of, of its original birth is in Uncle Vanya. And this, what type of character is it? We can say it is a, a type of character, as you said, it's very relevant for our time. We have, I mean, I have felt so many times in my life like Uncle Vanya. Maybe not Uncle Vanya, but Vanya. The, we will get to that. Why? Uh, but what changes when we call him, when we think about him as the Uncle Vanya. Uh, but I've also met a lot of people who I would characterize using that type, the type of Vanya or Kafuko in Drive My Car. So what can we say about this character? We can say he's intelligent. Um, he is, uh, he's, he's hardworking. You know, he haven't had much break, much luck in his life. And he has had some ideals that he, he used to hold very highly. He used to really believe, but now he has discovered that those ideals, the people that he has served, the, the person were, things that he believed in, things that he valued, things that he's made sacrifices for, they have let him down. 
in Kafuku's case, that is maybe we can say his wife, uh, the, the love, the relationship with his wife in the case of Uncle Vanya, they, we, in that, um, the setting that in the, in the play, there is a story of, the story is about a family, a group of people who are peasants who are very hardworking. They live together in a kind of building a state. They run the state together. There is a character who joins them, who is the professor. And we learn that they have devoted so much of their time, energy, money, so much of their resources to this professor. And they've, they've believed in him. And Vanya's position is unique in relation to the professor. So any, uh, sorry, I'm talking too much. <laughs> sorry, Javier. <laughs> Go ahead. No, you're good. I mean, it, it really is a character that is worth talking about. He, it's, it's hard not to identify some part of yourself with him. It, just the idea, I mean, how many people have I heard that, you know, I, I really like the part where he's just sitting on the chair in the beginning and he's just kind of like, you know, look how meaningless this is. You know, all I do is just I work and I sleep and I do this and it's just all this void. It's all this emptiness. And um, yeah, and he's tired. Yeah, he's tired. He's yeah. tired. Mm -hmm. And he is, he's not, it's not a tired, it's not a kind of tired that you rest from it. It's, it's, it's an existential tired. His mode of being is tired. His being tired is, is the, his way that he's is, is, is entangled with his identity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he drinks. Um, he wakes up late, um, goes to bed, goes to bed late, wakes up late. And there's also, there's no horizon. There's no future that he, he can look forward to. Uh, what did you think of the professor? So the, the, the man who is like, uh, he's working very hard. The man, the, the professor is, uh, is a person who, um, he really is confident. He's sure of himself and what he's doing. Even though what he's doing is really uh, not that significant. But he has the luxury of certainty. He's very confident, full of himself. <laughs> Yeah, I, I found his character to be probably the, the one that was uh, a little bit impenetrable for me in terms of like, I just, I I mean, I, I understood it, but I felt like there was just this, it, it's funny because in the play, it actually represents this pretty well. There's just like this cold distance. There's this cold distance that is unsaid between the professor and everybody else. Mm -hmm. you know it's like we've done everything for you and then it's just like you but you and your work and you know he doesn't see how pointless it is you could say um yeah. but i don't know it's it's i i guess it's because he's so occupied in his work that it he actually comes off as unrelatable to me and and and, and i think that the actual characters in the play display this too Mm -hmm. he's just so uh disconnected mm -hmm. from reality in some fact it's weird <laughs> mm -hmm. it's weird that he's like in some sense you i got i get the impression that he's so disconnected from actual reality um, yeah yeah there's this moment in the play where they have a big argument they have a big fight and they calm down and the professor comes back to the scene i don't know if you remember this part and he says you know what? Everything is fine. Everything is okay. In fact, I can feel like an article is forming in my mind about all of this. I was like, wow. Wow. So for him, like everything is translated into, so he embodies a kind of pure rationality, a, a rationality that is so rational that it's absurd. That is, it, there's no point in it. And he doesn't see that. And things have a point for him if he can turn them into an article. Like, come on, man. <laughs> Where is the compassion? Where's the humanity? Where's the like the the a moment to take take a moment to see the people around you? So for him, the articles that he's writing is working on is they are more real than the people and the pains of the people around him. Yeah, the <laughs> to kind of add on that. What, what kind of made me laugh is when Uncle Vanya kind of pulls the gun on him 
And kind of after the situation resides, the, the professor's like, yeah, but you know, I, I understand. I, I understand, I, I, you know, why he would feel this way. But, you know, we can kind of go past this and, 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 and remedy and so on. Uh, and <laughs> I'm just like, wow, I mean, you just got like a gun pulled on you. You, you would have died if it didn't, if the gun just didn't already run out of uh, bullets or jam up or whatever. Um, yeah. Like you would have died, but he's just like, yeah, you know, uh, I understand, you know, it rationally kind of makes sense why you'd want to kill me or, you know, or something like that. Yeah. I just thought that was, that part was so funny because mm -hmm. uh, he still kind of resorts back to this disconnectedness. It, he's like trying to relate to the, to Uncle Vanya, but at the same time, it's like a complete dismissal of Uncle Vanya. He still doesn't see it, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Oh, interesting. I think that the, their disillusionment with the professor happens because he moves in with them. He used to be away. He used to be a, a professor working at a uni university in St. Petersburg. Or I don't remember it, the location. But he moves in. He, gets, he retires and moves in. And they kind of see him. Uh, and and they, they, uh, they are let down by his by something, you know, by, <laughs> it's difficult to put the label on what it is that they see, but he becomes real to them. Uh, it becomes disappointing to them because even though he is, as you said, you, you said he's not transparent. He's, he's difficult to, to see through, but he is, he plays a very organizing role for them. They, he justifies their hard work. He justifies their existence. And he organizes the people in that, in that household, including his wife, including the doctor, the doctor keeps going, coming back and going. And, you know, he, every time the doctor comes after a long trip, he says, I don't need you. I'm okay. I'm feeling fine. So it kind of wastes their time. And because he's physically present there, it, it's kind of obvious that he's wasting everybody's time. He's wasting their life. So suddenly because they have worked so hard for that guy, they've sent him money throughout the years. So he's kind of pulling the rock from under their feet. Suddenly, not that th their life is meaningless now, they're kind of falling into nih nihilism now, but their past is also taken away from them. It's kind of painful. Mm. Yeah, it, it's almost like, <laughs> it's this irony where he becomes like the actual void in their lives. Mm -hmm. Like he, he accumulates and absorbs all of their work, all their sacrifice, everything. And it can never be justified. It's never justified enough. It's never enough. And so the professor just becomes this walking void for everybody. This reminder of like, when, when Uncle Vanya is like, I could have been a Schopenhauer. I could have been something, you know, I could have been, I could have been. And, and, and still, um, so it really shows how this professor has just been this relentless void in, in all of their lives you know even the wife she's like i'm bored i'm so bored with myself i don't mm -hmm. know what to do with myself and and so on and, and even the the doctor he uh <laughs> he, he 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 can't love anybody the only thing that he's not indifferent to is beauty that's the only thing that uh he says that manages to to still draw him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think is that do you think that's the reason why the professor leaves at the end in order to give them uh, to replace the void of his being there with the more theoretical void that they can at least use their imagination because if they don't see him if they don't physically see and sense his presence there then they can kind of imagine him as an ideal as something that is better than his actual self and uh, remember when he left they started to bring back the whole ritual of copying his article or doing accounts or doing something. So his absence immediately was followed by them returning to their routine. So what do you think about that? Do you think that there's a reason that he left? I, I think this actually corresponds to the whole vanishing teacher act, you know, the oh. whole, the vanishing person um, where it, it's almost like this, it, it, I don't know. It's so funny in terms of just like when he's actually there, he, he's, he's like a void, right? But when he's gone, 
he's the actual, uh, he becomes the actual absent energy that reinvigorates them, you know, gets them working again and, and so on. So there is something about this lack, I would say lack with direction, <laughs> you know, right. uh, that depending where you point your lack, um, it, it manifests itself either as like this relentless void or it can manifest itself in some kind of vigorous energy, some type of wholeness, but with, I don't know, it, it's kind of like, it, it's so lacking that it becomes full. Mm. I think that's the best way to put it. The lack is pure. It's not a lack that is combined with the presence. It's like being in a long distance relationship. And that affords us the ability it affords us the ability to imagine the, the loved one as perfect, as exactly the thing that we want. But if the long distance relationship ends and it's like, you'll have to live with a the person, then the, it's a real person. He said, uh, when he was leaving, one of the last things he said was, keep in mind, everybody, we have to be practical. And coming out of his mouth, that was really, I was like, what? You are asking them to be practical? That didn't make sense uh, to me, to be honest. Uh, but maybe that is, the, that is his uh, way of being practical, to remove himself so they can, maybe the, his, that lack is the practical solution to the problem of living with ideals. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's ironic that it's the most practical person that leaves. Uh, and, and we can almost take it, it, it's this idea of practical that becomes absent, that they're able to sort of live their lives <laughs> in a more abundant, you know, like I, I look at this like, because he does, he does represent this man that is so practical. Um, and yet, even when he says, yes, be more practical, he's gone. Mm -hmm. Who, who's going to enforce being more practical? Um mm -hmm. No, no, there's no one that's going to enforce to be more practical. And, and maybe, ironically, they, they do become more practical in certain in terms of they, they get back to their work. Right. Um, Let's say for a moment that we can turn the professor into a very much larger, much more abstract figure like God. There are more and less practical ways of relating to God it would be very practical to just say, I believe in God. My life is organized by God. I wake up, I pray, I go to my business or go to my work. I don't think or question, uh, question God or question God's decisions. I just do my own business. I go to my shop or I clean, clean my house. And, you know, I do my routine. That is a very practical way to have a relationship with religion. But if you start like a theologian's relationship or a philosopher's relationship, that is very impractical. You're constantly putting question to the absent party. That could be one thing that he means by we must be practical. Like don't, uh, don't deal too much with me. Do, don't deal with, with me directly. Live your own life. Mm. Maybe. No, yeah, I, I, I like where you're going with this because makes me think about, you know, really how rituals can become so empty when people say, oh, I'm, I'm doing it for God. I'm doing it for God. I'm doing it for, for him. Uh, but the thing is, uh, just to kind of bring back a, a famous verse from the Quran where he says, uh, you don't, there's nothing that you can do for me. You do it for yourselves. You know, you, you listen to my commands for yourselves. So there is this sort of ironic thing going on where if you do it for God, so externally, it becomes empty. It, it actually almost becomes uh, resentful mm -hmm. and, and you can, you can almost, and this can manifest itself in a variety of ways, whether either you hate God or you just, you know, become so loyal that you just hate everybody else and, and, and become bitter. Because again, you're doing it for God. But then when you finally realize that you're not satisfied, that all you've done, all your devotion is, has come to just nothing, then you really see the, the mistake that you've been doing. 
Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think we, there is room for this interpretation to kind of look at Uncle, uh, Uncle Vanya and his, um, I think his, his niece uh, as the devout worshipers of this professor, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Now let's uh, talk about this role of Vanya, uncle. Uncle Vanya. I think it's a reference. I think it's fair to, to assume it's a reference to that final monologue, that beautiful monologue that is really strange. It, it's really, it, it brings in a very religious sentiment, very spiritual, uh, you might say, a, very, a sentiment. Sonia is talking to her uncle. And the uncle is just. And that, that, that is really the, the part that I think drive my car made it more beautiful with that smile. I, I went to that last scene uh, of when they in drive my car, they are playing on, this, on the stage, they are playing Uncle Vanya and he's, he looks up, they are doing the accounts and he looks up and looks at Sonia and says, and smiles. There's a sweet, sad smile and says, I'm so miserable. And then, or I'm, I'm unhappy. There are different in different versions. Uh, Vanya says different things to Sonia, and then the monologue starts. Sonia's monologue begins, and that I really encourage everybody to go watch the the play. I can't really summarize it in a way that is fair to the monologue, but the essence of it is we should um, we should frame our suffering in a lot in a broader perspective. We should think think of our our lives, our, our destinies, our sufferings within a broader uh, view of life that recognizes the beauty of life. Life is beautiful and we will be, be suffered, but we will rest. We will have at, at that last final moment of our lives when we are you know, close to, to the end, we look up and see the stars uh, of uh, you know, stars in a beautiful sky. Um, so it's the, the title captures that I think that the kind of in, in plea, Sonia is making a plea to Vanya. So the whole play becomes Uncle Vanya. Uh, and it's an encouragement. So that's that relationship then in Drive My Car changes a little bit and see that Sonia in Drive My Car comes and stands behind uh, the Uncle Vanya actor. And the, the duality of I'm talking to you kind of uh, fades a little bit and she's making sign language and he is looking at the sign language, looking at the statements through one single perspective. So it's the two people kind of melt into or mend into one. So there are some differences between the more recent version and the older original version. Yeah, no, I, I like that perspective where it's Sonia comes in as the almost like the reframer of, mm -hmm. of, of what Uncle Vanya is kind of heading towards. Um, where it's like, yes, there, there is suffering, but then, you know, if you, if you look at it this way, um, there is a beautiful, you know, I think, I think he, uh, there's like a beautiful misery to it. Uh, if, that, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just to kind of share... Uh, so I so I wrote down a couple of quotes that I really loved in the play. Sure, please. I, and I think it kind of exemplified some of the stuff. Um, the first quote that got me was, "What man must be to destroy what he can never create." Um, that that line really hit me. And then there is another one that says, "When you find such beautiful people, they must be loved." And then another one was called uh, a struggle for existence beyond human strength. Mm. So there's almost like this element of like predestination almost. It almost, it almost feels like that where it's like, you can't change any of this, uh, but it's how you, I, I, I guess it's more like how you want to, deal with that unchangeableness mm -hmm. in the end you know because it's there it's you know it's always going to face you mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I think Sonia comes in, you know, with this plea. Uh, and it kind of reminds me of Iqbal's quote where, where there's a man praying and he says, look, I don't pray that your destiny be changed. I pray that you change. Um, and, and I feel like Sonia is doing the same plea. It's it's because it, because ultimately Uncle Vanya realizes that it's gone. All his chances, his his ideals to be a Schopenhauer, to be to be a Dostoevsky, it's all gone. It's all wasted. Um, so what what can you do now? And, and and the only plea that Sonia does, almost, is like, just don't be this bitter about it. You know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just say yes to this. Yeah. Just say yes to this destiny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, say say yes to this life that we are, we are living, Uncle Vanya. And it's significant that it's coming from Sonia because uh, Sonia is also suffering. Sonia has has been suffering uh, at like the pain of loving someone who doesn't love her back, and she has been hoping. And eventually, at the end of the movie, at the end at the end of the the play. Um, the doctor leaves leaves them and she comes back and she is not at a state we don't expect her to be in a state to to calm to console another character but she does and that makes it even more significant mm -hmm. anything else uh no i mean i i, I thought it, again i really thought it was a beautiful play yeah um, i i never I was just like, wow, I, I, I got to buy the, 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 the book, you know, the, the actual play, <laughs> the book itself and stuff to read it because just the words, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was a significant difference from drive my car in terms of dialogue. Right. So exactly. Huge difference. So huge yeah. that it almost makes me want to say like that, that drive my car wasn't a good movie. <laughs> you know, it almost makes me want to say that, but I, but it's, I mean, I don't know. It, it's like I said, I, I think it's this artistic kind of inversion where it seems like in Uncle Vanya, everything is a little bit more explicit. Everything's more poetic. Everything is more and so on. But actually in, in Drive My Car, it's the, the reverse way. It's more like the silence, the movements. Those are all the, the poetic languages that you find in Drive My Car rather than the actual dialogue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I, I felt the same way about the quality of the writing. The, the, you actually can taste it, can enjoy, savor the, the words, the, the statements. And it's, it's been written by a great, you know, classic writer. Uh, and uh, I, I wonder, you know, people who, um, like Murakami name drops, um, we can say, we can accuse him of name dropping. <laughs> And people who name drop, one, there are many reasons for name dropping. Some, sometimes it's justified. Sometimes it's, it's valid. It's a valid, it's, I mean, there are good reasons to use people's names to give credit to them, so on and so forth. But one, uh, one uncharitable way of looking at name droppers is that name droppers have not yet incorporated the thoughts of the person that they're name dropping. So if I, let's say, name drop Nietzsche, that uh, means that I'm still struggling to, to live, live in accordance with Nietzsche's or speak in accordance with Nietzsche's ideas. Because I'm struggling, I'm still like not, I've not digested Nietzsche and it's undigested. So it's just like undigested food is coming out. Like, so the name Nietzsche, you're like, I have to say Nietzsche. I cannot just talk in a way that is in harmony and consistent with Nietzsche. And I think sometimes Murakami has that kind of name dropping. So he couldn't digest Chekhov's play. So he just, he ended up just including it by name. It's like, yeah, they were, uh, they, they were, uh, there was a record of Uncle Vanya's play in the car. <laughs> so, uh, but that's good for us, the audience, because, because we can take a, a direct reference and go explore it on our, on, our, on our own and then come back and see how is it uh, related? To, uh, how could it compare with this movie? I don't know. Just I have several theories of name dropping. That's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, yeah, you're right. Mur Murakami does uh, do this. And ironically, I saw a review for the, the Drive My Car and, you know, it's been getting a lot of excellent reviews and, and stuff. They're like, I think it's the, the best. I think one, one, one article is like, I think it's the best, like, Murakami uh, ad ad adaptation ever, you know, mm. of, of actual Murakami's uh, works and so on. So I, I think the one missing element is that I actually haven't read the, the short story mm -hmm. that Murakami wrote. Because um, I feel like now it would be such a wonderful comparison to do Drive My Car, now that we've done Uncle Vanya, mm -hmm. and then the actual, what actual, what Murakami actually wrote um, to you know, kind of piece it all together. Yeah, it's on full circle. <laughs> yeah, full yeah. circle. <laughs> this is great. This is like the, the hermeneutic process because we are not just, when we're going back and forth between the play and the movie, it's not like we understood this first piece and then we understood the second piece and oh, it's nice. It's not just nice. It's not like for, for the sake of being complete, for the sake of doing more things. It's about like enriching our, our experience of the movie and reaching the experience of when you, you read the story, we enrich the, uh, well, what did, what did he do with Uncle Vanya? How is he referring to it? Um, and maybe we can, uh, look, we can look at it as first a commentary on like, this is my homage to Uncle Vanya. And this is how this story could be, uh, could be happening in our time. This is how an Uncle Vanya, this type of character, this archetype could be living amongst us now. And he's, maybe more exhausted because we are like we live in burnout societies and so we are more exhausted we are more hopeless and we are less maybe we're less self-aware we don't say things like i could be a schopenhauer <laughs> so kafuku doesn't have that kind of aspirations he's just generally tired yeah yeah check off uh it, it, it's really haunting how accurate he is because like i can't tell you how many times i've had heard those exact lines from just people in my life and i i've said it myself a couple of times growing up um just this you know all we do is just work sleep eat it's just nothing it's all the same thing it's meaningless you know it's just you know what what's left to do um and, and gosh i mean just the fact that Chekhov can nail that down mm -hmm. that existential tiredness uh meaning that uh, you know meaningless um that what's even more haunting is not everybody has a sonia yeah not everybody has a sonia um and that's Chekhov's gift to to us he's giving sonia to all of us he's calling us he's saying hey uncle Van all the uncle vanyas of the world <laughs> you know <laughs> this is a gift to you imagine um yeah cool great i really enjoyed this um, yeah, looking great. forward to future continuations of this uh, thread. Thank you, Absolutely. Javier. <laughs> Thank you.